okay. I'm home. I'm home in church, but I'm a stranger around this neighborhood, especially because of a, a structure. It's not far from here that I don't always like seeing around an area called the White Hat Lane. And so, <laughs> but God be God. I do want to apologize for not being here this morning because um, <laughs> someone's already accused me and said, you were meant to be here this morning. And I said, please pardon me, forgive me. I had to cover for Pastor Campbell in the Waltham Forest Church. And, uh, but I'm glad to be here. And I pledged uh, to that lady that I will be here again if I'm being invited next year after the, after the impact team <laughs> comes over to Nigeria. And I can be real when I'm with you. I don't have to dig deep and start looking for some uh, spiritual oratory to convince you that Jesus is Lord. Yes. This is something that you already know, and I'm glad for the hard work and the fruitfulness of our, your congregation here. You have more people in the evening service than many of us have in a Sunday morning service, and that's commendable, and I'm grateful uh, for all that God is doing here. I was also going to put in the offering um, a million naira, <laughs> but since your pastor refused any currency <laughs> other than pound sterling, I'm free from that burden. I'll take my, I'll take my naira back home with me, and. Um, and so that be the case. Uh, a few years ago, I had a lady and a couple rather, they approached me in church. And uh, they said that they wanted that God had been dealing with them. They wanted to be a blessing to individuals in our congregation. They didn't mention names. They gave me large sums of money. And they said to me, Pastor, we want you to administer these according to the needs that you know about. And I, we want you to help them jumpstart their lives, perhaps their business, something to help them. And then uh, later on that day, I drew up a list of potential people, people that I, in my mind, I have had to counsel. I know the issues. And I drew up a list of names of people that, uh, given time, uh, this money will be shared amongst them. And so, um, uh, uh, but I don't know what happened. One of the recipients had an issue uh, with the wife of the, uh, the couple. You know, uh, they must have had uh, an issue in the nursery and uh, the way perhaps they handle their children or their child and she does. She didn't know nothing, so she had a, a real issue, and they became very verbal and very, very annoying and everything. So uh, it came to my knowledge, and I had to sit down uh, with the husband and wife on one hand, and then uh, this uh, lady that was a potential recipient of some good money. Now, this lady did not know that this couple had given some money to be a blessing to her. And this couple did not know that this lady was a potential recipient of some of that money. Only I knew. And I sat down there like an adjudicator. I'm sitting down there and I'm listening to this woman that is about to be helped by this couple mouthing off and saying all kinds of things. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, if only you knew. And she, I'm trying to say, Shh, you know, you, you calm down. Let's, she wouldn't have none of that. She went off 
then uh, uh, the matter was relatively resolved. But then I made up my mind, you don't deserve to be blessed. At least not by them. And when I made that decision, uh, and the decision was hard to be made, but it was as a result of the words that she was saying, pushing them away, those that had been destined by God to be a blessing to her. I diverted the money somewhere else, and today the person that received it rather than her is flourishing, and the couple that gave are so blessed. It was from that experience that I wrote this sermon, and I like to preach it if you don't mind, not because I know things in your church. I'm only having one shot, and I have to seek the mind of God. What would help somebody if it's one person and can transform their lives and be a blessing to many others to learn from? Judges chapter 11. And I have no doubt that Pastor Abdul, given you know, in the years and the wealth of his experience will have preached around this. My aim is not to uh, contradict what he may have preached, just to share my own personal experience as a result of what had happened. Jephthah in verse one, the Gileadite uh, was a great warrior, but he was a son of a prostitute. And Gilead was his father. Gilead's wife bore him sons. And when they grew up, they drove Jephthah out of their maze and said to him, you will have no inheritance in our father's house because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Then some lawless men joined Jephthah and traveled with him. Sometime later, the Ammonites fought against Israel when the Ammonites made war with Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to him, come be our commander and let's fight against the Ammonites. Jephthah re replied that to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why then have you come to me now uh, when you are in trouble? They answered Jephthah, uh, since that is true, we are we now turn to you, come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will become the leader of all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to them, if you are bringing me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord give them to me, I will be your leader. And the elders of Gilead uh, said unto Jephthah, uh, the Lord is our witness uh, uh, if we do not do as you say. So I want to minister this evening a sermon I've simply entitled Destiny Helpers. And I want to consider with you uh, the wrong push. Now, one of the regrettable actions of any man is to fight the wrong person. And uh, we oftentimes, uh, you know, we, we want to engage in, in, in some sort of uh, arguments and uh, but could it be that the person that we are arguing with or the person that we are fighting against has been sent by God to help us? Not Maybe not now, but definitely in the future. Uh, you know, there was a story of a woman by the name of Joyce Vincent. Joyce Vincent died in 2003. And she died of an asthma attack. She had a flat here in the UK. And uh, on the day that uh, Joyce died, uh, the television was on. Um, and uh, the days after, mails were dropped frequently. Uh, and her rent was over, uh, was due weekly. So she had set up a bank, um, what I call a, a, a standing order, that every week out of her salary or out of her savings, her rent will be paid from her account until the bank account ran dry. And then days turned into weeks, uh, weeks turned into months, uh, and uh, the outstanding unpaid rent uh, was what got the attention of the landlord. The landlord was the first to uh, say, you know, she's not been paying her rent. And so she took, the, uh, to, she took her to court. And then um, given time, the court sent up 
send bailiffs to go there and examine what's going on there or try to evict her uh, from the house. Of, uh, so they forcibly entered the house three years later. It took a long time uh, for them to, uh, uh, the process, uh, it took a long time. So in 2006, they forcibly entered the house only to find out that Joyce had died on the couch. She had rotten away. Uh, her skeleton was there. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm sure the TV license will have been clocking it, you know, but, but <laughs> they, they knew that the television was on. Now, I, I begin to think about that. Why would somebody not be missed for three years? And the reason is simple. Joyce had developed an attitude of driving everybody away from her. She felt that she did not need anybody, not her neighbors, not her friends, not her work colleagues. And she had cut off all links from friends and family, choosing to live a lonely life and pushing everyone else away. Every one of us, we have a lane to run. And let me say this to you. Uh, it, it is wrong for you to judge others whilst they are running their own race. And perhaps because they're running slowly. In your mind, you're thinking they'll never get to their destination. I, here I am, I'm sprinting along. Uh, things are going well for me, but, but they have their own race to run um, and let them run it however slowly they're running it <laughs> because our help uh, does not appear to us the way we expect it to appear. Uh, it doesn't come with a signage or a signboard on the chest. Uh, I am destined to help you, but the problem with that is that we see others uh, not as help us but as uh, intruders we don't want them around us uh, because they haven't come advertising themselves but we ignore them um, we treat them cruelly or shabbily this evening and, uh, and, 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 and that's how we react I wish I know or I, I wish that my helper comes uh, waving a flag and said I have been sent by God to be a blessing unto you listen very carefully a few months ago I felt it, that I wanted to be a blessing to somebody in our church. And, uh, and so uh, this particular, about two or three people, and uh, this particular girl, um, she happens to be uh, a widow, and she happens to be a single parent. And I'd made up my mind I was going to be a blessing financially to her. And uh, so she's... Um, I've got, I've got the envelope in my pocket. I'm excited. I know, you know, this is what I want to do. And so whilst, whilst I got that ready, I could hear from the background, I mean, from the, um, there, there's an alleyway, just like a foyer that you come before you come into the auditorium. I could hear her arguing with the ushers. And they were telling her, you need to wear a face mask. That's during the COVID period. Uh, well, you need to wear a face mask. And she was like, well, I don't have a face mask. And, I don't, uh, and she's just mouthing off. And I'm thinking, no, not her, not today. And so she comes in. She must have had a, a, you know, a, a real argument with them uh, because eventually she walked into the building with a frown on her face no face mask in the mouth. I don't know how they allowed her in, but that's it. She, and I watched her. She hardly said hello to me. She walked by. And guess what? I kept my money. <laughs> I just kept it. <laughs> Who knows? God placed it in my heart to be a blessing to her that day. But she missed out because of her attitude. She missed out because as far as she's concerned, and she will never know except my wife tells her, and I hope this is not on live stream. But, but there you go. All I did was simply withdraw my blessings. And I begin to think, I, I wonder, how many prayer points have you believed God for and he has sent someone else to you just to share a word with you to release you or relieve you of the burdens that you carry 
and you drive your destiny helper away with words, with attitudes. Uh, you know, I begin to think about people like the widow of Zarephath. Had she behaved the way some of us behave by thinking how dare Elijah want to take from me, failing to understand that really what Elijah had been sent by God to do was to be a blessing to her. If he had driven Elijah away and said, you are an insensitive preacher, you're an insensitive man, and uh, you're wicked, uh, and you want to rip where you haven't sown, and she uh, just literally pushed Elijah away. Do you know that she will have died two days latest that, that, that time? But then uh, she allowed the destiny helper access to interfere with her own life. And because she did that, she lived many days afterwards. I wonder what would have happened. You know, I think about the Shunammite woman. Here's, you know, she had needs of her own. If she had ignored Elisha's needs, uh, speaking to her husband, let's make our home a hospitable place. I understand you have a minister of hospitality here, and you need to come and teach me some things. Yeah. But then, uh, you, know, you we would provide a place for you to rest. Uh, and, and then when she had needs, and perhaps God made that possible so that when there would come a time when the destiny helper would visit her, what do you have need of? Oh, don't worry about it. I'm okay. No, no, no. Tell me. Well, I don't. She doesn't have a son or she doesn't have a child. And she, he called her and said, This time next year, you shall bear fruits from your body. And uh, but that's what she needed the most. God will always send destiny helpers to you on a Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 2. The Bible said, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Can you imagine an angelic visitation and, uh, and you just, you just being a Christian, you get recognized by heaven. In our text this evening, who would have thought that a rejected son of a harlot? Look at the credentials that Jephthah carries a rejected son of a harlot denied access to his father's inheritance would end up being their destiny helper. The only person assigned by God to give the help them obtain victory. You know, I, I read a story a few weeks ago about a woman that went into the bank. She said this was, I went to the bank hall, banking hall yesterday as I was about to enter the hall, a, a lady ran ahead of me and pushed me away so she could join the long queue well before I get there. I did not say anything. She thought I will, uh, she thought I will queue up behind her, but actually I was not going there to withdraw. I was going to deposit. So I walked to the deposit teller and I was the only one there, not, not a single person on the queue. When I finished depositing my cash, I was about leaving the hall when this lady came running after me to apologize for pushing me away from the line. With a sorry smile on her face, she said, I'm very sorry, dear, for pushing you away. I thought we we're coming, you were coming to the queue to withdraw. I smiled and I told her not to bother that it's not a big deal because our destinations is not the same. In life, you have a lane to run. And I understand that, that there are people that try to outrun others, thinking that if I can get ahead of you, then I, uh, it's a sign of uh, me being better than you. I'm progressing before you. The question is, who are you pushing away or who are you trying to outrun in this race of destiny? There is a race that's been set before us. There are people that try and outrun people in business. They are trying to outrun people in ministry, in career, in relationships, in appointments. And in trying to do that, there is a tendency that you're pushing those that are meant to 
support you and help you, you're pushing them away or you're pushing them down in life. So the question I have for you tonight is simple. Are you amongst those that destroy others by pushing them away? I believe that you have a great church here. I read about, I hear about, I speak to your pastor a lot. And God will bring people to this church. And sometimes the, the tendency is that we see them come in and in our minds, we think they need us. They need our help. We are there to help them. And there's an element of truth in that. But you never know what they can become in life. You never know what God, the plan of God for their life, if only you would help them now, they could be an incredible blessing to you tomorrow, that they are designed and placed here by God to help you be who God wants you to be. Let me give you some examples this evening, and, and, and just trying to be very practical here. Uh, you can push others away by slandering them. And the people that you slander, you don't even realize that uh, they can be, they may have been des designed by God to be the answer to your questions. We can, we can push people away uh, by not only slandering them, uh, we can also push them away by backbiting them, blocking their promotion, lying about them, by hindering their progress. Sometimes all you need to do is to backbite and discriminate or spoil people's good name. Either you lie through rumors or you know, and I know that doesn't happen here in the UK, but, but it's, I know it's, it's, a, it's a problem overseas, okay? There's a man in our church, I dare say a very unwise man, Here's a man that came into our church, bruised, beaten, battered, bleeding from other churches. That came to our church, he, he loves, he just comes with his family. Uh, it took a while for him uh, to blend in. And then he started blending in and then he uh, took charge of our worship team because uh, he's skillful in, in playing and allowed for that. And as you know, conference of 2019 in, in here in the UK, I'd made plans that I wanted to bring him and his wife over here. And uh, I did everything and I told them, I'd like you to come along with me to the UK. I'd like you to see the larger picture. Maybe you could come back and translate that to others. And so he was quite happy to do that. And, and, uh, but then he wasn't granted the visa. And somewhere, uh, I, I, I thank God that he wasn't granted the visa because he had other motives. But then the reason why I sponsored him was because I really did feel that God had brought him to our church and under me to help him to help heal all the wounds of his past. And, um, and I was doing that until uh, Satan entered his heart and uh, he turned and uh, he rebelled, not against me, against everything that we stand for. So he left. But before he left, or soon after he left, he began to spread lies, and they always do. He began to say, well, Pastor Glenn is jealous of me. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I could be jealous of him about. But then he said, uh, and then one of the things that he said that was so ridiculous was that Pastor Glenn is actually jealous of my dress style. <laughs> that I, I, he, I dress smarter than he does. And he was about the same size as me. And, and so some of the things that, you know, had become uncomfortable for me because of the enlargement 
I was given to him. I, I was I say, hey, listen, come over to my house and I'll spread the shirts uh, and, uh, and the suits and uh, some of them. Yeah, you know, I just say, hey, would you like to have it? He takes them all because there is no one comparable in size in our church apart from the, just the two of us. So, uh, so he was quite happy uh, to receive uh, and he would wear them with joy. And now he now says, I am jealous. <laughs> but, but because he was bent on defaming my name and my character, anything goes. And, and, and you begin to say, I was, and I told him when he was leaving, I said, you're missing out greatly because I believe that God brought you here so that I could be a blessing to you. Be careful who you push away. The woman in our story that went into the bank uh, you know, didn't assume that we were all in this for the same reasons. Our path may look similar, but our destinations are different. What God has for you differs from what he has for someone else. You may be in the same church, but God's plan for your life is unique. So don't try and say, well, what God is doing in his life or in her life ought to be done in mine. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And this plan is so beautiful. It's so unique. Yes, we synergize. Yes, we, we, we come together and we, uh, you know, we make a beautiful uh, church. Uh, but, but within the church, not everyone's the foot, not everyone's the eye, not everyone's the ear. And if God has called you to be the little toe, you'll be amazed how important you are in the body of Christ. Is, has anyone ever pushed you away? Do you feel that way? Or, you know, this happens. You want people to recognize, but it seems as though you've been pushed. Don't worry. I'll tell you, don't worry. God will use the situation of others trying to push you away or pushing you away to prove that the race is not only for the swift. God, God you know, I hear strange stories. People try and get recognized by by their boss and people in authority and so they they just do strange things and you know it was only yesterday i i i, I didn't realize it i mean i'm so ignorant when it comes to these things but it was i was in someone's house and his nephew had been a very good uh, uh, footballer he played for the irish premier league he, he's a good guy you know it's, I, I knew when he was, he was born but this guy grew up and so he said, I could have played for Nigeria. And, uh, and uh, the scouts came looking at, uh, at me play and they wanted me. Uh, but they said to me that I needed to pay them money, large sums of money to put forward my name so that I could play for my country. Isn't it amazing how in our minds, we have to push others away in order to be recognized. You don't need to do that in the kingdom of God. Don't worry. God remembers you. God knows your location. He knows where, where you're at. And when it's your time, as long as you're not trying to manipulate time, when it's your time, uh, the visitation of the Lord will come to you again. Say amen. Ecclesiastes in chapter 9, it says in verse 11, it says, I have seen something under the sun. The race is not to the swift, uh, nor the battle to the strong, nor the food comes to those uh, to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, uh, but time and chance happens to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their time or when their hour will come. Your hour is going to come, beloved. And when that time comes, nothing can hinder you from being recognized uh, for that promotion. God will pull you to himself when others push you away from themselves. God can give you overtaking speeds. 
I mean, like some some second wind. I mean, now I know you don't look at uh, in where I come from. Um, we see animals, you know, you have to go to the zoo to see animals here. Is that right? <laughs> we, we see animals in their natural habitat and stuff. And uh, you will see an animal. Let me do that so that you could also, when you see an animal, do this. I know the only thing that you see though that is a dog, but, but there are more animals than dogs, you know. It's like they're ready to go. They're ready to sprint. And sometimes that's what God just wants you to do. Overtaking speed. But the people that try to put you away would try and catch up with you. They can't. A woman, that woman felt completely silly. And then she had to go and apologize for her bad behavior. Years ago, we planted a guy out. I remember maybe it's the third or the fourth person that we planted out to take over a church outside of Lagos. It was the most expensive plant in my entire living life <laughs> and uh it, it cost me everything and uh, this guy was like a son to me so i was happy to you know he moved in three years he moved homes three times and and every move i pay for it because you know, obviously it was outside of station and so so it, it, one day he said i've got to move I said, why are you moving? I said, oh, uh, you know, I saw a snake. <laughs> I said, we're in Africa. <laughs> There's snakes everywhere. No, this snake came to my doorstep. Uh, and I asked him, did he stay? <laughs> or did he? said, oh, no, pastor, you want me to die? That's what it is. So, okay, you will not die. Move. And then he moved to another place. And this time, thieves came around. Oh, pastor. They're there. And he said, they're there, they're there, pastor, they're there. And I said, shh, 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 don't say a word. And so they vandalized his vehicle. And so, pastor, I need to move. Anyway, he moved severally. And then I said, you know what? I think mentally, you've been tormented. Uh, why didn't you come and refresh yourself? He would not have none of that. So cut the long story short. He came back to the body rather than just continue where he left us as a Christian. I mean, it is your attitude and your Christian attributes that caused us to trust the gospel into your hands. Rather than just, just come back and be a Christian, um, he wanted recognition. He wanted, uh, he wanted uh, I said, oh, pastor, these people are not calling me pastor here. I said, but you are not pastoring a church. <laughs> They're not calling me governor uh, because I don't govern a state. I just enjoy being in church. So he struggled and blah, 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 blah. Before you know it, I said, okay, he used to lead our song service. I said, you know what? You led song service all through your pastoral life. Well, why don't you just blend back into the, so at least give you recognition, you know, dignity and so So he will do that. And then the guys in, you know, things three years later, people say, okay, uh, 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 why don't you just let, well, you know, I'm a pastor. I'm sorry. Cut long story short, he left with his wife, said a lot of nasty, bad things about me. A few days ago, I mean, when he came back, I, we got him a job, a member of our church, I spoke to him, give him a job, give him a job. It was good on the job. And so, but then uh, he started behaving strangely. And so the, his boss came to me, who is a member of our church, and he didn't tell me he was bringing him to church. So he brought him on a Monday to come and see me. And, uh, and I hadn't seen him for, at that time, I hadn't seen him for perhaps five years. And uh, so he comes, he's, uh, he's kneeling down, he's pleading with me, begging me and saying, some nice things. Pastor, you are the best thing that happened to me uh, since the creation of penicillin. And you, have, you are you are everything. You, you are, Pastor, you have been so kind to me. And so uh, this is at the height of COVID. Uh, and uh, he's grabbing my, my leg. He's shedding tears. I'm thinking, okay, okay, I forgive you. Just leave the leg alone. There's COVID, you know. Now, I, I say all that because I, was, I believe I was sent by God to be his destiny helper. 
and he violated that. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so just about three months ago or two months ago, at two o'clock in the morning, I received the phone call from him. Again, after that time, I hadn't seen him. That was about uh, eight months, 10 months ago. I hadn't seen him. So I received a phone call and he started saying nice things about me. Two o'clock in the morning, Pastor Glenn, you are this and you are that. You are a father to me and I don't know what happened. Da, 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 da. And I'm thinking, okay, it's two o'clock in the morning. Can we talk about this in the morning? Oh no, Pastor, what it is? My wife and I, we're having issues. Da, 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 da. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, now you remember me. And uh, we did our best to help bring a resolution to that. And uh, so just as I was at the airport coming again, I hadn't heard from him again two months. And so I texted him. I said, hey, what happened? How are you getting on with your wife? Said things are getting better, but we still, in my mind, here is a man that had a destiny in God. Comes into a church as little as our church, helped, loved, prepared, going out to pastor, something triggered off a negative vibe, a resentment. And he loses out on, because his destiny helper didn't come the way he assumed it would come. Let me close and look lastly this evening at uh, if you want to make progress in life, and I dare say all of us want to progress in life. If you want to make progress in life, never push anyone in any way. Because you might be doing so to the wrong person. I was going to Namibia. I'd, uh, I'd, uh, I'm flying from Lagos to uh, Johannesburg and then pick up another connecting flight to Namibia, Wintook. And so all this is set, quite happy, couldn't preach uh, two revival meetings there. This will have been about eight years ago. And um, whilst I was there, I arrived in Gilberg at about five o'clock in the morning. I was completely tired. I don't sleep on the plane and I don't watch TV on the plane. I just stay. <laughs> <laughs> the older you get, you just want to get to your destination. And so I'm there, five o'clock in the morning, we arrived. And, uh, and then my connecting flight was at 10 o'clock. Now, I didn't have the privilege that many of you have to go to the lounge and just enjoy. Then I didn't, but now I do. And I know the difference. So I have to sleep on the airport bench. I, I mean, I call them bench. They're made of steel and they're just hard, you know, and they're not padded. And so I'm, I'm there five o'clock in the morning. Now I did not sleep on the plane. So I'm tired. And your body's telling you, you've got to sleep. So I got there. It was about six o'clock in the morning. It's the airport's beginning to be active. And I lay on one of those, looked at my connecting gate and I said, okay, it's going to be here. So I go to that connecting gate uh, at least. I would wake up somehow. So I lay down there and I slept off. Make sure you sleep on your rock sack so that all your valuables are, you know. So, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, and I just went off. I, I bet that I must have been snoring. And people would just walk up. <laughs> so I slept off. And then I started hearing voices. And I knew, oh, maybe by now um, uh, it's time to board. Yeah. So I woke up. It was about nine o'clock and I woke up. My mother just slept for about three hours, not enough. But then I woke up and I saw the queue going to Vintuk, a long winding queue. And I'm thinking to myself, I came here first. <laughs> <laughs> but I slept off. I'm thinking, you all saw me sleeping. Every one of you, no denying this. So I got my, I got my, 
uh, uh, my bag with me. And you know, the, the African mentality came on me. I'm not a gentleman anymore. It's my birthright to be in front. And so I'm there and you pretend as though you don't know what you're doing. I, I know none of you have ever done that before. Not in any queue. So you're there, you're there. You back them up and just move a little bit. Because I'm thinking, I got here first. And so people must have looked at me. So I'm looking at the people. You don't look back because you will see their faces. You look at <laughs> So I'm looking at all of them. I'm looking for someone that might just look gentle. Someone that I can connect with and pretend as though we, we come way back together, you know. Someone with a green passport, perhaps. So, so I'm there, and I'm just looking. And, uh, and so you move so close. You, you're hoping that once they start, you start moving a little bit, and you just stop. They do it here. I listen, they do it here. I have seen it. City Airport, they do it. So you start moving that way. And so I'm moving. So a couple must have noticed me that, What's he trying to do? So I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that no one's going to shout, hey, bro, move it up. So I'm there, I'm just moving a little by little. And so I got to the front of this, by the side of this black couple, and they must have looked at me and felt sorry for me. They said, yeah, you want to come in? Um, you know, why are we so polite? And they said, really? Are you sure? Of course he said, come in. Yeah. Somebody said, come in, I go in straight away. I don't ask. Are you sure? Yes, yeah, so are you being polite? You, you say, are you sure? Say, yeah, 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 come in. Are you really, really sure? And by the time you're saying that you're already moving, are you sure? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Say, I oh, know, no, not worry. And uh, you could feel the vibes. You don't look back. Remember, I said, <laughs> don't look back. So I'm there and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, God bless this couple, you know? Just bless them, you know. I, I'm a preacher. I'm a man of God. Yes, you know I'm saying. I'm just saying. God bless you, my brother. So I'm there in the lane now. So I'm I'm there. So got to my turn to hand over my burden pass, and I handed over my burden pass to this lady. She looked at my burden pass. She looked at me, and I'm thinking, uh oh, what's wrong now? You know. And she looked at my burden pass, and then she looked at me again. So you're not meant to be on the queue here. Rip my button pass. I said, oh, they allowed me. Just toy. And say, so she put it in. Beep, it didn't, it didn't go through. Beep, it didn't say, nah, you know, ripped it. And then she issued me another button pass. And I said, oh, okay. Thank God. I got a button pass. I'm going. And so we're getting into the aircraft now. And so you get to the entrance of the plane and you hand over there. So what, what's it? I was then I looked at the bottom pass and I saw lay, uh, uh, seat 3A. All my life, when I get into the plane, I go right. Huh? <laughs> How many of you, you go right? If you go, if you go left, you, let us know who you are. And so all my life, you get there, you're already going to... <laughs> the lady took that and said, no, no, you're, you're meant to be in business class. <laughs> <laughs> then the business persona came upon me. I said, thank you. And I'm looking at the couple behind me. I'm thinking, hang on a minute. They're the ones that gave me their, uh, their, the chance but then I, you know, you quickly forget. <laughs> I'm a business class. So I, I, I go to the business class and I sat down there. And, uh, I, you know, I've never flown business class. And so I know some of you are regular business class flyer. But, and so I sit on the seat there. And then it was about 10 seats there. And we're just about four of us. And I'm thinking, I wish that couple can come and join us here. We business people. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there 
And I'm looking at all the bottoms there. They're different levels. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm looking at all the bottoms there. And you know, you you know, you're trying to just test it to see how it works. <laughs> and I pressed one, and I'm feeling the massage. <laughs> It's good to be wealthy. <laughs> and I'm quickly adjusting myself because I'm in Nigeria and we can adapt to any situation. So I'm just I quickly adapted to that as well. Yeah, I know that one. I know how it works. <laughs> and so, but then there was a, a, an African or some sort of that was sitting next to me. He said, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good. I, I'm a businessman. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I was trying to prove that I'm a businessman. So he said, where are you going? I said, Vintuk. He said, what about you? Where are you going? He said, I'm going to Vintuk too. I'm just going there for a weekend to shoot game. Huh? <laughs> and you flew business class to go and shoot animals? <laughs> I said, what about you? I said, um, I spread good news. <laughs> Paraventure. I'm being labeled as a prosperity preacher. I said, I spread good news. Oh, that, that's good. That's good. That's, that's, I'm, I'm sitting down there and I'm taking selfies. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Everybody must know. Now, when we got out of the plane, I looked for that couple. And I just needed to just shake their hands and say, thank you for giving me that chance to stay in front of you. See, in life, God will send destiny helpers to you. Now, that, since that time, I've had the privilege of being upgraded a few times and in business. So now I'm used to it, you know what I'm saying? I just go in like, a, you know, like an experienced man. I, I get in, I just give them my jacket, I take that. Uh, and then um, they come in with the champagne and I look around. Is there any Potter's House people here? <laughs> You know, <laughs> and so, and so, I didn't take it, but you know, but I get used to it now. So, uh, oh, <laughs> I, you know, it's good to help people because you never know how you will be helped someday. Let's bow our heads. God will send people to this church. People would come in here and they wouldn't come in with a flag or a placard that said, I've been sent here by God to be a blessing to you, but they will be a blessing to you. There are some of you that have come into this church, haven't been sent by God. Could have been a flyer that you received, could have been an invitation, could have been a friend. Could have been just, you were, you were just passing by. But you have been brought into this assembly for a purpose. Number one is to surrender your life to Christ be a child of God. And that's where we all started from. When we confessed our sins, we repented, Lord, I'm sorry. I've done things I shouldn't have done, been places I shouldn't have been, said things I shouldn't have said. I've associated with people I have no business associating with. Would you have mercy on me? 29 years ago, those are the exact words that came from my mouth. As I walked into the Walthams to assembly, went in for a concert, came out as a saved man. There are people here, you've walked in here as a sinner. Don't walk out as a sinner. I overheard your pastor praying by name for people. Could be one of you. You save my brother, save my sister, rescue them from the jaws of hell, redeem them, renew them. 
so that someday you would reward them. And you recognize yourself that you're separated from God. You don't have the peace of God. You don't have the joy of the Holy Spirit. You're not saved. You're not right with God. You're not born again. Beloved, God loves you. And if you'll be humble enough, if you'll be truthful to yourself and recognize the state of your heart and cry out to help because the greatest help comes from above. The Pastor Glenn, Pastor Abdul, I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want to become a child of God indeed. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something very simple. Would you quickly raise up your hand and put it back down? Anyone at all? God loves you. Come on, lift it up. Maybe you're a backslider. You knew God at some point. You had a relationship with God. It's a great, it was a great relationship. Things were going well. He was restoring your life. You were glad, made friends, had expression perhaps. But as you sit in the building tonight, that had been tampered with, seen as intruded and interfered with that relationship. You compromised. But as you're seated here, you recognize the love of God is still reaching out to you. He wants to help you. And you're a, you're a backslider. Would you come back to Jesus, please? Come on. Would you raise up your hand? Let me pray with you, backslider. Backslider.